Good morning and welcome to our session number 98 on driver rehabilitation, providing the right service at the right time. My name is Clive D'Souza. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's session and helping me out will be Lauren Dundour. I will uh, be providing you the CEU code at the end of the session. So please make sure you stick around. Um, we have a couple of instructions. Please place yourself on mute during the presentation. You're welcome to post your questions in the chat window during the session and our presenters will get to them at the very end of the session towards the last 10 minutes. With that, I would like to turn it over to our two presenters. We have Liz Green and Amy Lane. Please take it away, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. And thank you to the University of Pittsburgh and the International Seating Symposium for having us here today. We wish we were all live and in person in chilly Pittsburgh, but here we are and really happy to be here and I'm glad you had an opportunity to join us today. I'm Liz Green, I'm the um, excuse me, I am an occupational therapist and a certified driver rehab specialist, but I'm also the executive director for the Association for Driver Rehabilitation Specialists. And my co-presenter today is, is Amy Lane and I will give her an opportunity um, in just a couple of slides to introduce herself and share with her, you her varied um, and impressive background. So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to kick off this um, conversation today with a Hawaiian word that really describes flawlessness. And the reason that Amy and I um, really like this is because it ties back into the purpose of the spectrum of driver services, which is a publication we'll be talking about today. But the um, Kina Ole definition is doing the right thing in the right way at the right time, in the right place, to the right person, for the right person, with the right feeling the first time. And those of us in healthcare or service industry, working with people with disabilities or have had, who have had major life changes, this is always our goal. So with that in mind, we're going to move in to um, who we are and what we do. So Amy Lane, if you would um, kindly introduce yourself. Thank you, Liz. So I am Amy Lane. I'm an occupational therapist and a certified driver rehabilitation specialist. I work at the University of Pittsburgh and I operate a driver rehabilitation program here in Pittsburgh. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to the next slide. And as you're reviewing our long list of disclosures, we're gonna warm up our little fingertips here and have a little exercise in the chat. So. Please, um, all of you that are in attendance today, if you would um, give Amy and I a very important piece of information. And in the chat, if you would please let us know what your favorite childhood snack was. And we're gonna give you a couple seconds to pop that in. I'm gonna tell you my, what mine were. Cracker Jacks, Butterfingers, lots of sweets. Dunkaroos, thank you. Are we hungry now? It's almost lunchtime. So in addition to your favorite childhood snack, the other really important piece of information that's gonna be helpful to both Amy and I as we proceed is what is your professional background? So you've heard mine, I'm an OT and a CDRS. Um, what are yours? So I'm a physical therapist, OT and ATP. OTs, lots of OTs in the room, PTs in the room. OT student, welcome to all of our students. All right, awesome, thank you. And the last chat activity question here is on a five point scale. Five being you are a CDRS or a mobility equipment dealer. One being you can spell the word driver. And what I'm asking is how familiar are you with the driver rehabilitation or automotive mobility solutions. Scale of one to five. One is I can spell driver, five is I'm a CDRS or a mobility equipment dealer. So I have some ones, threes, 3.5s, 2.5s. Any, any fives in the room? 
All right, very good. So we're gonna move on into um, today's purpose. So driving and transportation holds value for all individuals across the lifespan. The purpose of this session is to highlight the wide range of services related to driving and community mobility, driver rehabilitation programs across North America and worldwide provide a range of services related to driving and driving transportation for persons with disabilities and whose driving skills are significantly affected by medical or age related changes. It's imperative that program terminology is clear and understandable to healthcare professionals, service providers, and consumers, especially when attempting to establish effective and efficient referral pathways. Attendees will be provided with available resources, strategies for initiating conversations about driving, and information on when to refer to the appropriate level of programs and services. During the session, we have also provided in your handouts a document that defines the spectrum of driver services ranging from basic driver's education to high-tech driver rehabilitation programs. This document is provided to all stakeholders invested in driver services with the information on when to refer to the right people to the right service at the right time. Next slide, please. So what is driver rehabilitation? Driver rehab is a type of rehabilitation that helps individuals facing challenges caused by disability or age to achieve safe, independent driving or transportation options through education or information dissemination. A certified driver rehabilitation specialist is a driver rehab specialist with additional training and certification. A specialist generally has a healthcare professional degree with additional training specific to driver evaluation and rehabilitation. Certified professionals are those that have successfully passed the certification examination and regularly complete education in the field to maintain their, their credentials. I'd also like to point out that within the past 18 months, ADED, ADED has rolled out a micro-credential driver rehabilitation professional. And that is an opportunity for those interested in the field to um, start their pathway towards earning their CDRS. Currently, there's over 400 active certified driver rehab specialists in the United States and Canada. So there's three main areas that um, are showing up on your screen today that driver rehab specialists primarily um, work in. And the first area is driving yourself in your own personal vehicle. So driver rehab specialists evaluate, counsel, and train drivers with disabilities and the aging. This is the most common service provided by a specialist. A comprehensive driving program consists of screening, evaluation, which includes a clinical assessment and a behind the wheel assessment, and training and vehicle fitting. Another area you might find a specialist working in is driving yourself in a, another vehicle. Some specialists are consulted to assist those desiring to return to work or other vocational activity. This includes farm equipment, commercial truck driving, and other types of machinery. And finally, we don't wanna forget the passenger. Driver rehab isn't only for the vehicle operator. Quite often, the specialist is consulted on assisting caregivers and safely transporting their loved ones who are no longer drivers. Next slide, please. It is imperative that program terminology is clear and understandable to healthcare providers, service providers, and consumers, especially when attempting to establish effective and efficient referral pathways. And it is with this problem statement that the American Occupational Therapy Association and ADED, the Association for Driver Rehab Specialists, created what you'll see on the next slide is the spectrum of driver services, providing the right services for the right people at the right time. We're going to take a few moments and tour this spectrum of driver services. Again, this document was a collaboration between AOTA and ADED. The purpose of the spectrum is to clearly identify the roles of professionals across the realm of driver instruction and improvement. 
by using this document, referral sources and consumers are able to identify the right service at the right time. We'll move on to the next slide. So um, the kind of the um, there's three main areas that the spectrum is grouped into, and the first area is community based, and driver safety programs fall into that community based grouping. They are offered typically by groups such as AARP or AAA. Examples of some of these programs include AARP's Safe Driver Course or online self-check. On the slide is another example, the fitness to drive screening measure. Oops, there we go. Um, offered through the University of Florida. These education-based, often self-paced programs are provided in a classroom or online setting and offer the driver strategies for self-driving and driver re refresher information. The outcome of these types of programs is to provide public education and awareness. Driving safety programs are an out of the pocket ex expense for the driver. Many of them, however, are offered at no charge. The next type of community-based um, driving programs are driving schools. Driving schools are community-based programs and um, often provided by licensed driving instructors who are certified by the state licensing agency or the Department of Education. Driving schools provide instruction to novice or relocated drivers via classroom and or on-road experience. Driver's education may be required for novice drivers based on state requirements. Driving schools also may be an out-of-pocket expense for the driver. However, some states provide driver's education through the school system for novice trained drivers at no charge. From community-based, we'll get into the medically-based grouping of the spectrum of driver services. So when a person has transitioned from community-based needs and now has a medical um, condition that may interfere with driving, the first step that they might encounter is a driver screening. A driver screen is a medically based assessment, education, and referral completed by a healthcare professional, such as a physician, social worker, neuropsychologist, to indicate the need or for follow up for medically at risk drivers. Providers have knowledge of relevant medical conditions, assessment, referral, or the intervention process. A driver risk screening is typically an insurance covered service for the medically at risk driver if performed by a qualified healthcare care professional. The outcome of this screening is to identify and determine driving risk and or to need the need for follow up for those medically at risk drivers. So after that screening, the driver might also be evaluated in a clinical instrumental activities of daily living assess or evaluation. A, cl a clinical IADL eval is a medically based assessment, education and referral completed by an occupational therapy practitioner or other healthcare provider with experience and in instrumental activities of daily living. A clinical IADL eval is often an insurance covered service for the clients with medical considerations if provided by a licensed healthcare professional such as an occupational therapist. The outcome of a clinical IADL eval is to identify and determine driving risk and or the need to refer the medically at risk driver for future driver rehabilitation assessment. And finally, within the medically based grouping, next slide please. are the driving services. And so this is if for the medically at risk driver, if driving is the concern um, of need at the time, driver rehab programs include specialized evaluation and training provided by a professional with advanced training, including a driver rehabilitation professional, a certified driver rehabilitation specialist, or an occupational therapy, with advanced training such as specialty certification and driving and community mobility. These providers are skilled at applying knowledge of medical conditions and implication to driving. 
using a, a evidence-based out evaluation tools. They assess the cognitive, visual, perceptual, behavioral, and physical limitations that may impact driving performance and integrate those clinical findings with assessment of on-road performance. In addition, they often coordinate multidisciplinary providers and resources, including driver education, the healthcare team, vehicle choice and modifications, community services, funding or payers, driver licensing agencies, training and education, and caregiver support. Clearly, it takes a village to help people achieve their goals of returning to driving. Within these um, driving services is another grouping. And these are um, kind of a tiered approach to addressing and servicing uh, drivers with disabilities. Basic driving programs offer evaluation, training, and education. They may use adaptive driving aids that do not affect operation of primary or secondary controls, such as additional seat cushions or additional mirrors. They may include transportation planning, cessation planning, and recommendations for clients as passengers. If the client has more physical limitations and is going to need uh, more assistive devices in the vehicle, the next slide will see the low tech driver rehabilitation program. These programs provide all of the basic programs plus adaptive driving aids that affect the operation of primary or secondary controls, vehicle entry and exit, and mobility device and storage and securement. At the low tech level, adaptive equipment for primary control is typically mechanical. Secondary controls may include wireless or remote access. And finally, for those more medically complex drivers, they could be seen by a high tech pro driving program. These programs quite often will offer the basic and low tech services. In addition, they will offer a wide variety of adaptive equipment and vehicle operations for comprehensive driving evaluation, training, and education. At this level, providers have the ability to alter positioning of primary and secondary controls based on the client's need or ability level. High-tech adaptive equipment for primary and secondary controls include devices that meet the following conditions. They're capable of controlling vehicle functions or driving controls, and they consist of a programmable computerized system that interfaces or integrates with an electronic system within the vehicle. So did you get all that? We're gonna have one little recap slide. It's a lot of information if you're new to this area. So just as a recap, there's three main categories of driving services available to the public. You have the community-based programs, which include your driver safety or awareness programs, plus driving schools. You have medically-based programs that include the driver screening, and the clinical IADL programs. And then you have the specialized driver rehab programs that include those three levels, basic, low-tech, and high-tech services. Next slide, please. So some, of the, some thoughts about the spectrum document. Programs will vary. Um, this table in the, that document is the first step in educating stakeholders, physicians, consumers, families, and you about what is available to your clients or your family. Um, it's not all the same for all countries, but it's a framework to, to help start um, other countries to address driving. We understand that it's also being or has been used in Ireland as a model for their medical guidelines. We use this to help us advocate for our clients and make sure that they are getting entered into the right program at the right time for the services that they need. So, and again, thinking about that kina ole, um, we want to make sure that we are providing the right service for the right individual at the right time. And with that, I am happy to turn this over to Amy Lane, who's gonna continue the conversation. Thank you, Liz. All right, so far now, I'm 
back to driving us. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so first of all, thank you so much for going over that spectrum document. Hopefully that gives you guys an idea about those different models and, and again, where to refer and who to refer to. Um, so next we're gonna talk a little bit about like who are those key players that are involved in driving and transportation. And that includes you guys. <laughs> um, so, uh, so who are those key players and who are the, 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 what are the roles? And, you know, this, as Liz has alluded to, the decision-making process really does work best when there's a collaborative effort. I think rehab personnel are often tasked with making that determination of like, you know, can somebody drive or not? Or what type of vehicle might you recommend? Or where would you go for training to get vehicle modifications? And, you know, a lot of you guys don't, you're asked those questions, but you don't have the answers to it. And it's really ideal to have a collaborative team working together, or at least know who those key players are and who you can refer to and who, who are your resources. So <clears throat> let's look at some of those key players. Who are they? So consider this little kind of daisy chain diagram um, that we're all connected. Um, some more maybe are emphasized more than others, but all serve the purpose of helping that consumer, that client who's in the center. And that client may, may be a driver, but could also be a passenger. But obviously, they're the most important person in this collective daisy chain that we have. So everybody who's listed here, everybody has knowledge and skills that are going to help make decisions about the person's ability to resume, resume driving or what vehicle they may need. Um, and if they're driving with or without modification. Often, it is the CDRS or the driver rehab specialist who's going to help coordinate this process, but everybody has a role to play. So let's take a little closer look at um, who those key players are and what their roles are. So as I mentioned before, the client is the center focus. And then we need to talk about whether or not they're going to be a driver or a passenger. I think we all agree transportation is a cornerstone for independence. That's a given in our society. And we need to understand what our clients needs are, what their goals are. And, and everybody could do that in their clinics or their respective um, work environments. And I think every profession in that daisy chain that we showed earlier is responsible for inquiring about a client's needs and goals and really get the big picture. As a team, then collectively, we can share what we've learned, make those best decisions and recommendations can be made. And I know when I'm doing an evaluation with a client, there's kind of three major areas for consideration when we're talking about those clients' goals, desires, and needs. And the first one is their living situation. So we really wanna get a good background about their living situation. That provides invaluable information. Knowing their living environment, their support systems, um, that's really going to help us in making those decisions. You know, maybe they have a traumatic brain injury and they're using adaptive uh, or, or a wheelchair and they may need adaptive equipment. And we really need to decide whether or not they're ready to pursue driving if they're still living in a supervised setting. So the background history, a little bit about their living situation helps. Secondly, we want to ask questions about their employment, vocational and avocational life roles. Um, do they need to drive because of their work or their, their, do they drive for a living? Uh, will the wheelchair that they're using or the mobility device need to be transported or kept at home? Sometimes we find that, that their mobility device that they're going to be using, they keep it at their place of employment and they really don't need to transport it. So that gives us a lot more information about um, their equipment. Are they gonna need it? Is it needed for transportation? Um, inside the home. And I know, I know from insurance purposes, for like Medicare insurances purposes, um, mobility devices are often prescribed for in-home use, but let's get real. People don't use it for just in-home. 
right? They're going to use it outside the home, in the community, and they need it for their job or their work. Um, so we, we want to get that information because that's key information when we're making decisions about our client. And then we want to ask questions about their functional status and actually do comprehensive evaluations. We're going to find out, um, you know, if you're working with a person who has a spinal cord injury and has, is presenting with quadriplegia, can they transfer independently? Um, maybe they can transfer independently, but it takes an excessive amount of time for them to transfer. Um, and that's really, I don't know about where you guys live, but here in Pittsburgh, it takes five minutes for you to transfer outside into your car seat. And the weather that we've had this week, not ideal, not ideal whatsoever. So we want to know about what their functional abilities are, what their ability is to break down their wheelchair. Can they store it inside their if it's a manual chair, can they break it down and bring it into the, the vehicle? Um, if they're gonna be driving, are they thinking that they're going to transfer into a driver's seat? Do they have the ability to transfer into the, the original equipment seat? Or do we have to consider that they may need to drive from their power wheelchair? For example, if they have a higher level spinal cord injury and transfers are just too, too difficult for them. So all those pieces of information are so critical and so helpful in that initial client assessment. So another key person in this process is the role of the healthcare professional. But, and that could be anybody, including you guys, it could be the physician, it could be specialists like neurologists or, or ophthalmologists, orthopedic surgeons even. Mostly I'm thinking about therapists though. So, so our OTs, our PTs, healthcare workers that are directly working with um, the healthcare uh, or the client, sometimes nurses. But what we know is physicians and therapists in particular are key influencers in the automobility industry. There was a benchmark study done a few years ago by the National Mobility Equipment Dealers Association. And interestingly enough, they found in their research that 71% of consumers who were planning or looking at mobility equipment, auto mobility equipment, they consulted with a healthcare professional before they purchased that equipment. And they found that 43% of those were physicians and 28% were therapists. So healthcare professionals definitely are a driving force in helping clients figure out where to go. And again, think back to the stuff that Liz was talking about. It's so critical that those healthcare professionals know where they're going to refer and who they're going to refer to for that information about transportation, equipment. Um, should they drive or should they not drive? Again, we're going back to that key phrase, the right service for the right of individual at the right time. And that's so very important. So the next... Kind of key player, and we're not going to go through everybody on that daisy chain. We're, I'm just hitting a few of them. So um, the next one is the seating specialist or the ATP. These specialists, and that's many of you I know on the line here, have the expertise to evaluate, modify, make recommendations about wheelchair selection and seating systems for that consumer's optimal position. Because let's face it, that person is sitting in that chair. Sometimes that is, they're sitting in that chair for 16, 18 hours a day. So that's so important that they make sure it's a good fit for their comfort, their independence and their quality of life. But the seating specialist also should consider the implications for the mobility device and the ability to use outside the home in the community. And I know this is completely contra to insurance carriers, but it's a factor and it's a variable we need to consider. Um, we really need to examine that client and the family's ability to transport and secure that, that device in the wheelchair. Um, I sit, my office here, literally right outside a seating clinic. So I know firsthand how important it is that I'm pulled in sometimes in that conversation and talking to people who are looking at wheelchairs. We can explore things like, is it is that wheelchair really going to be able to be transported? Are you going to have to, if you get that device and you want to take it to an amusement park or to the mall or to the store, how truly are you going to be able to get that out into the community? 
And sometimes there's even little key tidbits of information that the seeding specialist might have, or, or that they know globally whether or not, for example, a power wheelchair has the ability to use an electronic docking station in a vehicle. They might know that, but they may not know all the little nuances. For example, I recently had a client that got a specific model of uh, a power wheelchair. And when they looked online to see if an electronic securement system was compatible with that chair, it indeed said that it was. Unfortunately, the tidbit and the little piece of information that those people did not have that I knew and the mobility equipment dealer knew is that that specific wheelchair could not pivot on the axis of that docking station. So what happened is the person got this brand new wheelchair and they were looking at getting a vehicle with the anticipation that they were gonna be able to pivot once they got into their vehicle and they could not. And so now they have a, a power wheelchair, a very, very expensive power wheelchair, with a lot of bells and whistles that they cannot use in their vehicle as intended. So that's a great example. Um, I have no resolution for this story because we're still in the midst of it, um, but it, it, it just shines the light on the fact that this, this collaboration is so very, very important. We're, we're talking about wheelchairs and what, what wheelchair would work for the person in the community and outside their home. <clears throat> okay, so the role of the supplier or the seating supplier, again, very, very important. This is often an ATP or some type of seating mobility specialist. They are also a key player in this process as well. They have the ability to set up and trial that wheelchair seating system. And they can sometimes talk to the, the, the client about those transportation options. And I know my seating specialists that I work with around here have great relationships with our mobility equipment dealers. And they call them and ask them these questions um, about how to transport and what are some of the options. Uh, if a client's gonna be riding in their power wheelchair as a seat in the vehicle, we need to be exploring that that chair is compatible with the securement system. And is it WC19 compliant? So, more considerations for our team of key players. And then finally, bum, 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 the role of the driver rehabilitation specialist. So driver rehabilitation specialists are often healthcare providers, OTs, PTs in the VA, they may be OTs or KTs, sometimes recreational therapists, but generally healthcare providers. But there are also those who have traffic safety backgrounds or traffic education backgrounds. Regardless, these are professionals that work in the field of driver rehabilitation, driver training or transportation equipment modifications for persons with disabilities or age-related changes. Now, a CDRS is somebody who is, has gone above and beyond uh, to obtain additional education, training, experience, uh, taking a certification examination, and the certification validates that education and experience, benchmarking that that person, that CDRS, is an expert in the field of driver rehabilitation. Um, and the purpose of certification, similar to your ATP certifications and any other professional certifications, it really protects the public. It, it, it provides a measurement, a standard of the current knowledge uh, that's desirable for people that are practicing in the field. Uh, it encourages independent or individual growth and study. We have to maintain our certification by continuing education. Um, it really promotes professionalism among driver rehabilitation specialists. <clears throat> I think I think Liz mentioned earlier, I think it was on an earlier slide, there's about, about 400 across the country in Canada right now. So there's not a lot of us in the, in the world um, and we're always desiring more. So if it's something you're interested in, please reach out to either of us, um, not promoting CDRS, but uh, no, not selling anything here, but if it's something you're interested in, please reach out to us. Um, again, the CDRS, uh, again, there's 
definitely a demand for more individuals to obtain and practice as a CDRS in the US and in Canada and across the world. So <clears throat> I see a whole bunch of chat. I'm so sorry. Can I just check? I'm just curious, were there any questions? Yeah, I'm, I've been trying to address them in the chat as they come in, but we can recap at the end. If you okay. Know. All right, we'll just wait till the end then. Okay. Yeah, if there's something pertinent to what you're asking that I can't answer, I will draw your attention to it. Perfect, that would be great if you could just chime in and interrupt me. Okay, so so hopefully this gives you a sense of this far, kind of that spectrum of driver rehab services, everybody's key role, how we should all be working and playing together in this in this field. So next, what I wanted to do is take a few minutes to Kind of talk about how do you apply um, this knowledge given a case example and so i just have a couple case studies and i thought we could kind of talk about it uh, talk about some barriers to successes in driver rehab identify what our roles are and and kind of what our responsibilities are as we're as we're working with some common scenarios so i think at this point yeah if you we could definitely open up the chat and have people kind of chime in as we're asking these questions. So <clears throat> the first case study that I, I pulled up, and let me kind of read through it and then we can talk about kind of the questions. So John is a 40 year old male, has a spinal cord injury at the C67 level. He has a manual wheelchair. Uh, he's used that for 20 years, very independent with his management of that. But because of his age and progressive loss of function in his shoulders, they're just kind of wearing out. He's interested in exploring the use of a power wheelchair. He's gonna be going to your seating clinic. Um, he's also interested in getting a new vehicle as there's very few sedan sized vehicles on the market that are gonna give him as much room in the cabin for breaking down and transferring his wheelchair. He's got an old Chevy Impala. And he's even recognizing that just the time it's taking him to do a transfer, break down his wheelchair, um, you know, pop off the wheels, lean back, lift it over, like many of our clients do, and lift that wheelchair up and over, sit up, you know, the wear and tear on his shoulders, the wear and tear on his vehicle, it's just getting too tiresome and burdensome. So the first question I have for you guys, and I think what we could do is just maybe just chime in on the, in the chat box, who would be some of the key players that, based on what we just talked about, key players, who would be involved in this case? Like, who would you think, you yeah. know, obviously the ATP, the, the seating specialists, because they're coming to your clinic, but who else might be involved? Some of those people in that daisy chain that we showed you earlier, or just people you think might be involved. Anybody? Just stumped them on the first question. Oh, that's the easy question, guys. <laughs> All right. I will. A I'll, physician. We, got, we have an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. The physician, because typically a physician's involved in doing uh, either writing the script or doing part of the uh, assessment, the seating assessment. Um, off the top of my head, obviously the client because that's the center of focus. Um, the seating specialist is definitely involved. The supplier is going to be involved. Um, a CDRS or driver rehab specialist is going to be involved because we're talking about driving and transportation. And then also the mobility equipment dealer. So those, who, those are kind of who I thought of. So if this person is coming into your clinic, the next question I have is based on the spectrum of driving programs, what level of driver rehab service do you think that you would refer this client to? So remember the levels are basic. Thank you, Liz. And there's also, don't forget, reported basic, low and high tech. You also have community-based programs. You have driver screenings at kind of that low end of the spectrum. So, yeah. Okay, thanks Lois. Yeah, I would say it is low tech for sure. Um, 
So it could be basic. Remember, usually we're not dealing with any adaptive equipment. The low tech is usually dealing with simple technology, mechanical devices, hand controls, spin or knob, maybe a high tech program, but you definitely would not want to refer this, this type of person to a community based screening program or a classic driving school because we're talking about some adaptive devices as well as vehicle modifications. So you want somebody who's at least knowledgeable um, to match that desired survey, knowledgeable and, and has a program that has that type of equipment. So then the next question I have is, what considerations would you, would, would the seating specialist address? And what kind of conversations would you bring up with John when you're talking about the power wheelchair? Like what, what things might you think he needs to be considering knowing all these things about his driving? Um, maybe he's asked, he's gonna ask you what he might need, what are his options? So what, what things might you, what conversations might you have with him? So Lois said uh, driving from the wheelchair possibly or using a six-way power base seat. So he would may use, so if we're looking at a power wheelchair, right? That's probably what he's looking at. He's likely going to need a wheelchair accessible vehicle. And I would completely agree that if he's using a wheelchair accessible vehicle, so we're talking about like a ramp van, a lower floor minivan, but don't forget, he could also use a truck. There are trucks that have modifications that would allow him to operate, um, get in and get his power wheelchair in and out of a truck. And then he could also use any type of adaptive driving equipment to operate that. Um, and I like the, the, the two options. So if he, one option is he, maybe he's, um, he wants to drive from his power wheelchair. He's just completely tired of driving from doing that transfer. So if he's gonna drive from his power wheelchair, <clears throat> and I'm kind of jumping into the next question as far as considerations that the driver rehab specialist might have. Um, if he's gonna drive from his power wheelchair, he may need to consider uh, wheelchair securement systems. So how is he going to secure that wheelchair in the driver's station or in the driver's position? Uh, four point tie downs are not designed for a person to apply themselves. So we're gonna look at an automatic docking system like Easy Lock, Q-Strain has options that we frequently prescribe for that person to use where they can just ride in, it docks their wheelchair into that driving station. Um, the alternative would be if he, if he can still transfer and he's still okay with doing a transfer once he's inside the cabin of his, of his uh, vehicle, um, he could then dock his wheelchair in the midship position of his vehicle and transfer up to a six-way power base seat. Um, some other considerations I see coming in is understanding his home and employment situations. That's great. Um, yeah, is there anybody else that's going to be in the vehicle with him? Is he going to be the only one in there? Um, and does he need to use this on a regular basis? Uh, does he work daily? And so is he driving to and from work? And is that two more transfers he has to do every day? Again, maybe he doesn't want to do that anymore. And he wants to drive from his power wheelchair. Um, are there secondary drivers? Um, so that's a question that's coming across. Are there secondary drivers? Can you still transfer? And for how much longer? Um, so if there are secondary drivers, that's a great point. So if he's planning on driving from his power wheelchair, <clears throat> that means there's no driver's seat in that position um, if he's driving. It doesn't mean you can't put the driver's seat back on top in that position. What typically happens is that that driver's, the OEM, the original seat comes out, it rolls, it's on wheels, it rolls down the ramp, and usually people keep it in their garage somewhere in their house so that that person who's using the wheelchair can ride up into that driver's position. Um, if somebody else has to drive that vehicle, that there is an issue there. So if, if he cannot drive to work, 
and then expect somebody else to drive him home. He does have to be the only driver that's going to drive that vehicle home because otherwise there's not a seat in that, that front driver position. Um, but if, you know, what a lot of people do at home is they decide whether or not they're going to have somebody else drive that vehicle that day. And so they'll just put the OEM seat, the original equipment seat back in that front position and maybe a family member will operate and uh, John might ride as a passenger that day. So there's options, but you do have to do a little bit planning ahead if he's planning on driving from his power wheelchair. So great point. Um, and Steve also asked the question, can you still transfer for how much longer? And that that is absolutely a consideration and a question we always bring up with people. Um, many times people want to go with the least amount of equipment, the, 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 the minimal amount of equipment. And sometimes we're the ones talking about, well, let's talk about 10 years from now. What, what do you see yourself doing 10 years from now? Um, because that's important. Uh, to think about how much longer are you going to want to transfer? Um, is it maybe another year or two? Maybe we do need to think about you driving from the power wheelchair. With that in mind, um, I need to make sure I make it clear that research, everything we know about driving from the wheelchair or driving from the, the driver's seat, it is always safer for the person to drive from the car seat. Uh, that is a safer seat by far than driving from a wheelchair. So just so we're all clear on that recommendation. So, so great job. I think we got through all those, those questions and those issues. So I'm going to jump ahead. Um, we're going to do one more case study to discuss. Um, so I want to talk about Jane. <clears throat> Jane is a 45-year-old female driver. She has a diagnosis with, of MS and she presents with right hemiparesis. She was recently hospitalized and lost some function, mostly just strength in her upper body and her lower body on the right side. She can ambulate for short distances, but with effort and she fatigues quickly. Um, she can transfer independently. She's a single mother with four children. She works part-time. She has funding for some services through her vocational rehab counselor or vocational rehab program. She has an evaluated evaluation coming up at a seating clinic with a goal to explore using a power mobility device as she recognizes she now needs to conserve some of her energy. So again, first question I have for you guys is who are the key players? Who, who would be involved with Jane? And who do we need to think about who's collectively on this team? Feel free to write in the chat box. If you would, please. So in addition, actually, here, let me ask this. In addition to those key players that we identified before, who else is on the team? Who else would we want to include as part of that key player? In addition to the, the last time I think we identified the client, the seating specialist, the driver of specialist, the suppliers, the mobility equipment dealer, physician. Who else? Liz, who else do you I think? Would, I would say since vocation, voc rehab is involved, we want to make sure that counselor is highly involved. Exactly. Yeah, I would definitely include the counselor. Yeah, because that's your funding, her funding source. So we want to make sure they're involved. And sometimes they're helping to make uh, some of those decisions and involved, intimately involved. And the only other uh, people that I was thinking of is maybe the therapists that are working with Jane. Uh, and, you know, she's gone through, she's been hospitalized. Maybe she's an outpatient. Maybe she's working on regaining some function. So we need to be in, in collaboration with those therapists and talking about um, progress and potential for improvement because we may not want to over-prescribe something or maybe we do, knowing that this is a progressive disorder. So those are some of the things we might want to think about. And, and again, we don't want to be working in our silos. We want to be having these conversations with the entire team. Um, the next question, what level of driver rehab service would you refer her to? Um, and just like before, it's going to likely be a driver rehab program, the low tech. Similar to the first case study, you would not want to go to a classic driving school or even a basic driver rehab program. 
you want to make sure you're referring her to a program that offers at a minimum low tech equipment based on her past medical history and her current functional abilities. So then if she asked you guys, like, what do you think? What kind of motor vehicle? Because she's in your clinic, she's getting a power wheelchair. What would you say if she said, you know, what kind of vehicle do you think I'm going to need um, based on, you know, I'm getting a power wheelchair, I need something big. What would she require? <laughs> Liz, thank you. Is, is, is that the wrong answer? A, a well, two-seater yeah. convertible? <laughs> Unless we put a rooftop carrier with the kids on top. I don't think yeah. so. <laughs> um, yes, a van. Um, typically, yeah, I would say instead of a van, now there are there are transit vans. So we're, and so when we talk about vans, sometimes I think I think years ago, like the big Ford E E line full size vans with raised roof, but the more frequently we're, the uh, the options are like a Ford a Transit, Connect, um, some of those bigger vehicles, and, and a lot of times we use those more for transit for mass transit versus private passenger vehicles, but it is an option. Um, the other one that was listed was a ramp van, and that's typically what we're looking at is a minivan. Um, that's going to give her the most options for use of the power wheelchair. It's gonna allow her the opportunity to conserve her energy, um, and it's gonna offer the opportunity for her to transport all her kids, because the van is gonna have enough seating. It's gonna have three seats in the back, potentially one seat in the front for, for kids. So she can definitely fit everybody. Assuming all one of her kids can sit in the front seat because um, of the airbag. Um, but the, the point here is you're often asked this question. So you have to kind of think about like, what, what, are, what, what might she need? And if you're not sure, you, you always wanna reach out to the CDRS, the mobility equipment dealer to get that information, talk to, refer that, that person on to somebody like me or the mobility equipment dealer and remind them, do not purchase anything until they have talked to somebody who, who can kind of look at that. Uh, Cause you don't want her buying a Mazda Miata thinking she put her kids on the rooftop. That would be a bad thing. Um, or buying a vehicle that she thinks she can convert and it's not able to be converted. Um, Steve said, you should, she should seriously consider a power wheelchair due to current conditions and knowledge that the condition is progressive. Fatigue is a big issue, not to mention having kids. I completely concur. Folk rehab um, can assist her with a lot of the equipment needs. Um, get the van with the transfer seat and later remove that and let her drive in the power wheelchair. Excellent. That's exactly kind of the, the, the route we would encourage somebody to do. Sometimes we have people that get a little stubborn and they don't want to give in to their disease process and they don't want to go that route. But a lot of times we have to encourage them and think again, 10 years ahead, what's going to happen. Um, minivans have reduced weight capacity. Absolutely agree with that. Um, she has kids, so weight capacity likely would not exceed the gross vehicle weight. It could. And that's where your mobility equipment deal can actually look at what the uh, gross vehicle weight is and assure that um, everything on the additional equipment, the power wheelchair. And that's another reason why we're sometimes we're like, oh, you know, the person has a 450 pound wheelchair. It's like, oh, that's a heavy piece of equipment in a van. Um, so yeah, we definitely have to explore that. Love that comment. Thank you so much. Um, okay. And then the last question, and I'm gonna go ahead and answer this, how will she store and secure her wheelchair in the vehicle? Uh, again, probably electronic wheelchair securement system, maybe in the midsection of the vehicle. We need to make sure that that power wheelchair is compatible with an electronic system. And again, the power transfer seat base will allow her to get up and into that um, seat, and then she can drive with her adaptive equipment. So. Thank you guys, great, great responses. Um, I am gonna skip over our third case study because we are just about out of time. So hopefully talking through all these case studies really helped you shed some light on the fact that we should all be approaching driver rehab as a team 
not in our little silos and our, our little teams. Um, you know, even though I got a great team outside my room, you know, we still got to open that up and broaden that and include other key players. Um, remember that spectrum document that defines the range of services from community-based to basic driver education to low-tech to high-tech programs. The intent of that document is to provide all the stakeholders, all the key people like you guys who are invested in providing information to their patients and clients about driver services. It really was designed to give those key people accurate information on when to refer the right people to the right service at the right time. So these are not the right pieces of equipment, <laughs> but um, love this little, little image. So at this time, does anybody have any questions, thoughts on where you see yourself fitting into um, what we've talked about today, um, discussing driver rehab services with your clients? Any questions, feel free to chime in. Um, we do have some resources here on this page that were provided before. And finally, let me get here, resources. And again, if you have any questions, both Liz and I are available. These are our email addresses. You could reach out to either of us and ask questions. Amy, so, Amy, Liz, thank you so much. This was terrific. You covered a lot of content, um, very engaging. Um, so I think Liz, you've been keeping an eye on the chat window. Um, yes. If you see any questions that have not been addressed so far that you'd like to address now in the next few minutes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I have been trying to address questions as they come in, but there was a comment, Amy, that maybe you can provide some advice. And the comment was, that unfortunately, there's very little collaboration between seating supplier, client, and the uh, mobility industry. There should be. In this person's experience, um, it's not so much collaboration, but it's reaction or reactive. And a lot of money, time has been spent um, that has to be fixed on the back end. Any advice on bringing together these, these players before money, time, expenses have been um, spent? I, I, I know, you know, I, I gave the story even here in our clinic that happens. And, and I think we have kind of a, an ideal clinic here and collaborative work that's going on here. And we still have the same issue. There's not a perfect answer. I also think that, you know, and today, one of the things we've learned over the past two years is that virtual communication is so much easier than it ever was. Sometimes picking up the phone, picking up, um, doing a, a, a FaceTime chat, it is a great way to tap into some of your mobility equipment dealers and their, their knowledge and expertise. These people deal with this on a daily basis. They know the ins and outs. And I've had sometimes my mobility equipment dealer tell me about wheelchairs and what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Um, so they're dealing with this on a daily basis. I would encourage you to reach out to your mobility equipment dealers, go out and visit them, meet with them, they are more than willing to share information. They love to get, um, and just so you know, my other hat is I do work with the National Mobility Equipment Dealers Association. So I know this for a fact, they are very interested in working collaboratively for clients and making sure they're getting the right equipment and the right connections. Um, sometimes it's, you're limited, I get it. Time is hard, um, but a quick phone call, a FaceTime, a, a virtual Zoom, uh, you know, get your laptop, bring it out into the clinic, pull somebody up, um, talk to them. Sometimes that's very helpful. That five minute investment, even 10 minute investment can save time, can save us hours in the end. So um, no quick solution, but reach out to those people. The National Mobility Equipment Dealers Association, namita.org on their website, they do have a place where you can search for a dealer in your area. Um, definitely reach out to them and, and if you have not, meet them. So. Amy, before you get to the next question, I'd like to announce the CEU code. Um, it is CY9F0T. It's Charlie Yankee 9 Foxtrot 0 Tango. It's also posted in the chat window. 
And if we have another minute, uh, you can address, I think, the last couple of questions that were posted. Sure. I think there Sorry. was. Go ahead. Did you see? There's two that popped in. One of them, they're asking for what's an example of somebody that might need a high tech program? Yeah. Yeah. So typically with high tech, so we're talking about somebody who's driving by wire. So they're, they may be driving from their power wheelchair using a joystick driving system or a total, totally electronic gas brake steering in their vehicle. My experience with that population is they already know that they're, if they're getting a change in a vehicle and a change in function, they already know what their resources are and they're already coordinating that. But a good point to make with this, this group in particular is if you do have that person coming in, if there is a change in functional status, there's going to be a change in the vehicle or change a perceived change in the driving equipment. That is when you're going to need to pull in that high tech driver rehab specialist. Because anytime you change any of those things, it could change the whole dynamic of how what their setup is. Those high tech systems, they're moving things like a half an inch sometimes to get that person to become independent and in accessing their primary or secondary controls. So that's when you would really want to in incorporate uh, a high tech um, driving program. Okay. Um, the other question, do you see virtual augmented reality coming more common in this field? Great question. Um, I know there's a lot of, um, <laughs> Clive, you might be able to pull into some of this because uh, I know we've talked a little bit about like how, how do we start to do that with driving? I know there's some um, auto, uh, auto company, auto mobility companies, manufacturers that actually looking at this and integrating some of that um, augmentative reality into, dash, uh, into your dashboard and, and your, your windshield. Um, so yes, is it there yet? No, but it's, it's on the horizon for sure. Um, and you know, we, we, we all need to kind of keep our eye, no pun intended, on that for the future. I, I think we're out of time, so we'll have to end it here. Uh, thank you both, Amy, Liz. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, again, the CEU code was CY9F0T, Charlie Yankee 9, Foxtrot 0 Tango. Thank you all. You'll be right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.